Hi there, this is Lee Thurburn again, and today I'm going to talk about uh, one of the most important tasks that, as a Turo uh, host, that you're going to have to engage in, and that is buying cars. So last year, this is 2024, last year in 2023, we bought 12 cars. Actually, we bought 10 because we had two going into the year, but we did some swap outs. Um, at the end of the year, if you've watched some of the other videos, you know that we sold off three or four of the cars, actually at the beginning of this year, because of issues that we had with uh, recall notices, because we had four Hyundais. Uh, we actually had five Hyundais, but four of them got caught in a recall, so we had to sell off cars. And this year we've been buying cars, and we're actually kind of on a car buying spree right now, trying to add to our inventory. Now, I'm going to walk through the process that uh, we use as we're getting cars and almost all of our cars we buy off of Facebook Marketplace. We have purchased a couple of cars um, otherwise using car gurus as a source, but um, they tend to be a little bit higher priced, newer cars. And so, um, you know, our strategy is really pretty simple to try to find cars in the four to $5,000 price range knowing that we're going to have to put about $1,000 of repairs and maintenance upgrades into each vehicle to make them, you know, Turo worthy and, um, and then maintain them on an ongoing basis. So we use the Facebook marketplace, which I'm sure you're familiar with. And um, I use a template uh, as I'm going through the marketplace. Uh, I use a template and a process to be able to um, try to get the best deals. And so the template you see here on screen is pretty straightforward. Um, first, I, I record the, the year, the make, the model, the asking price, and the number of miles. And then I also get the information about the listing date and the location. I live in far, far north Dallas. It's almost Oklahoma, it seems like. And so driving, you know, to far distant parts of the Metroplex to look at cars is a real pain. So we try to try to find cars that we don't have to drive all the way across the Metroplex. I'm very rarely willing to drive from North Frisco to, say, somewhere in Fort Worth or South Arlington. Um, I like to try to find cars, if possible, in the North Dallas area. Um, somewhere basically north of I-30. Anyway, details don't matter. I mean, bottom line is I, I track the, lo the location and the listing date. Now, the listing date can be important. Cars that have been listed for a long time have a tendency to be more negotiable on price. Um, so that's one of the reasons we track that. Now, as you're going through Facebook Marketplace, there are hundreds and hundreds of cars. And so it gets to be kind of hard to remember which car goes with which recorded little data set that, that we have here on this template. So I do record the exterior and the interior colors and any special notes, you know, like if it um, has an interesting leather interior or something like that. So record special notes. And I don't really go much farther if I don't get a VIN number. Now, one of the things I've found is that on Facebook Marketplace, the people that actually post a VIN number or a picture of a VIN number in the listing, are they tend to be more professional. They tend to be people that have been in the car business or um, they know something about you know selling cars. Uh, people that don't post a VIN number don't realize that you know it's important for people that are buying, and maybe often they want to hide something. So uh, once you get the VIN number, and if, if somebody doesn't give you a VIN number after one or two tries to get a VIN number, then they've got a reason why they're not wanting to share the VIN number with you. Something about the vehicle is probably being misrepresented on the Facebook uh, posting, on the marketplace posting. Once I've got the VIN number, the next thing I do is I check for recalls on the NHTSA uh, database. And... Um, I tend to not even buy cars that have recalls because going to the, you know, going, getting the recalls fixed, it's just a pain. It takes extra time. Time is money. And, um, you know, so unless the car is extremely attractive, if it has a recall, I'm probably not going to go any further. Once I have a VIN number and I've checked the recall, I'm going to pull a Carfax report. First thing I'm going to do is validate the title and the miles, make sure that those things are being represented. And I cannot tell you how many times um, people have confirmed that they have a clean title or that the miles are accurate. And uh, then I pull a Carfax and find that there's a cloud, a problem, a brand on the title. There's, you know, the title's not clean. 
or that the miles don't flow. So watch the miles all the way through the history of the car. Um, it is actually extremely easy in, for many cars to be able to change the mileage that's shown on the odometer to make it look like the car has a lot less miles than it really does. Check the maintenance history specifically regarding oil changes. If possible, you'd like to see an oil change recorded every three to 5,000 miles. It's not uncommon, especially when cars are new, to see oil changes seven to 10,000 miles. Um, I don't like that, but you know, sometimes people will buy cars um, or rent companies will buy cars and they won't show any oil changes at all for the first 30 or 50,000 miles until the car is sold off by the rent company. And you have to presume that if it's somebody like Avis or Hertz or somebody like that, that you know, that they've done decent maintenance on the vehicle. If it's not a, you know, vehicle that, you know, you can track the rent history, then I basically, um, you know, record the rent hit or the, the maintenance history is anywhere between poor, decent, good, and great. Great is a vehicle where I can see miles changed throughout the history of the car every three to 5,000 miles. So very rarely do you actually find a car that has what I call a, a great maintenance history. Um, then I look for accidents. Um, I, don't, I won't buy cars that have anything other than minor accidents. And I prefer to you know, try not to buy cars that have accidents at all. But, you know, um, it, quite honestly, if you're buying 10, 12 year old cars, most of them are going to have some sort of a fender bender or something. So you kind of have to get comfortable with that. You want to be sure and when you do actually visit the car, check check extremely close for all the body fitments to make sure that everything's nice and tight because um, you know that's a quality of repair job and also indicates to you whether or not there's uh, been any kind of repairs that are not being recorded on Carfax. Uh, then I'll go ahead and pull Kelly Blue Book um, and uh, you know, sometimes I'll pull a Kelly Blue Book in advance. I mean, Carfax isn't necessarily before Kelly Blue Book, but what I'm looking for on the Kelly Blue Book is going to be the high trade um, and the low retail. I try to buy cars as much as possible, somewhere between high trade and low retail. Um, now, Carfax shows a retail and a trade value. I don't think those are as accurate in the marketplace as Kelly Blue Book. So I use that and then I, I give myself a, a target offer estimate, which I'll show you here in a moment. Then I record a little bit of information about the owner, whatever they've told me. Are they a dealer? Are they a dealer rep? Are they a private individual? Now, when you're going through Facebook Marketplace, you definitely want to look at the little profile of the person that's selling the car. Um, what you want to find, if you can, is somebody that doesn't have a whole bunch of vehicles or not a dealer or a dealer rep, because then you're buying the car directly from the individual. And that typically means a couple of things. Number one, they're not going to typically be as sophisticated, so they're probably going to be a little bit less aware of how, um, how to negotiate and buy cars, so you might have a little bit of an upper hand on that. Um, but also, um, it's just nice to be able to get a car from somebody that's been driving it for several years, um, not somebody that just bought it or doesn't even own the car. And, and of course, you get a lot of dealer and dealer reps trying to trying to generate traffic. Uh, it's a, it's a kind of a big business on the Facebook Marketplace, which I'm sure you know. Then, of course, uh, you want to get the actual location where you're going to go see the car, get a phone number for the person so that when you arrive, you can call them, set a meeting time. And then, and this is what's different this year compared to last year. Last year, that was the end of our process. But this year, we've begun using a scan tool. And I want to show off this big bad boy. Okay, so this is an X-Tool D7. This is not an unboxing video. I've actually already opened it up. But I want to show this thing to you. This has really been a big game changer. So this is the X-D7 from X-Tool. This is basically the way it comes. Now, there's some packing stuff that you know makes it a little bit less likely to get scratched. Um, it's really pretty simple. You just plug a cable into the ODB port, ODB2 port, and then plug it into this thing and turn it on. And you basically go through a very simple and very intuitive menu structure. You select the region where the car was built, like Asia or the United States or Europe. You, you select a region. Um, then you select the brand. Then you do an auto scan. It should 
in most cases, it's going to find the, the vehicle and the VIN number and verify that. Then you can go in and you can do a, an automatically have the system, have the thing automatically scan all of the different uh, control modules in the vehicle. And it's going to give you a list. And I got to tell you, this thing has already saved money. They're about $400. I think $460 on Amazon. You can get an $80 coupon. You end up buying these things for a little less than $400. And it's already saved me from buying um, a half a dozen cars that actually drove okay. But when I ran the scan tool on them, I found that there were engine codes being thrown that were not reflected on a check engine light. So the check engine light wasn't on. And but I was able to run and see engine codes. Now, you know, in my case, I don't like to see much, if any, engine codes or codes of any sort, but it'll check your engine, your transmission. It'll check the air conditioning system, the dash, uh, all the instrument cluster, power, the power windows and doors, all that kind of stuff. It is just a wonderful, wonderful tool. And, um, you know, I basically don't buy cars unless there's only a couple of engine codes for things that I know are going to be pretty simple to fix. Now, I'm not a mechanic. I'm not getting the maximum value out of this tool. But I basically want to just avoid buying cars that, that probably have some sort of problem with the engine or the transmission, especially the transmission. Buying these older cars, uh, transmission issues around 100 to 120,000 miles are not uncommon. And if you see any either transmission or engine control module codes that deal specifically with the transmission that show things like solenoids or valves or pressure sensors, that could be an indication that you're about to have to replace a transmission. And that's two, three, four thousand dollars. And so you want to avoid those kinds of expenses. So I run the scanner. I actually run the scanner before I even drive the car. Now, um, I have found that even with even with little sort of backyard home based dealers, very few people actually have a scanner. So what the scanner does is it also not only alerts you to potential issues, but it gives you tremendous negotiating power. You can look at codes that you know are not going to be terribly difficult to fix, and you can use that to negotiate the price down on the car. And then, of course, go drive the car because things like suspension issues and, and stuff like that, even brake issues, they're not going to show up on the scanner. Now, you know, brake system issues will show up, but the brakes themselves being a little squealy or, you know, about to go out, you know, but the main thing is suspension. Suspension stuff doesn't show up on the scanner. So you want to drive the car and make sure that it feels right, of course, to you. And then, of course, if you want to buy the car, buy the car. So here's an example of an actual, come on, click here. Here we go. Here's an example of a vehicle that I went out to look at just yesterday, a 2013 Chevy Cruze LT sedan. The guy was asking 4690, which was a little on the high end of about mid-range retail. It had 105,000 miles, which is reasonably low. So he just listed it like the day before. So he's near the intersection of Preston and Spring Valley. It's a white car with a black interior, got the VIN number. There were no open recalls. It had a decent maintenance history, had one minor accident shown. The high trade was 4,060. The low retail was 40,064. Extremely tight. It's not normally that tight. I was going to offer him 4,000 and maybe go to $4,200 if everything worked out. So I went and met the guy, ran the scanner, did not even bother to drive the car. Had a 25 different engine or 25 different modules that the scanner could check. Seven of them were throwing codes. Well, you know, if there's one or two for, you know, simple things, um, I'm willing to maybe drive the car and maybe buy the car. But there were engine codes, there were transmission codes, there were AC system codes, there were just all kinds of codes. And so it's way too many codes for me to be interested in. So I didn't make the guy an offer. So I just, you know, if you want to avoid problems that you can't identify by driving a car, get yourself one of these XTool D7 scanners. Now, here's a list of what I expect to find in the way of issues with cars. And these things don't necessarily scare me. Almost all cars are going to need some combination of these things, new tires, battery, upholstery, maybe repairs, uh, maybe brake, uh, brake jobs, certainly potentially alignments and tune-ups. Um, I, I have gotten in the habit now of getting every, every car that I purchase, I automatically just get a transmission service where I change the fluids out, check the serpentine belts, and of course, systems that could go wrong are things like power steering and brakes, AC systems, um, you know, windshield motor or window motors, 
uh, and that sort of thing. Now, you know, spare tires, you want to check and make sure you have both a spare tire and a tire changing, you know, toolkit because a lot of people don't have that. Oh, duplicate keys. I should have put that down there. Very rarely do you get two keys, so you're going to have to. Now, one of the nice things about the, the Xtool D7 is it can, in, in some cases, actually program keys for you. Uh, so, you know, you may be able to save yourself a hundred bucks for some um, locksmith to actually program um, a key fob for you uh, if you have the, uh, the X7. So, um, anyway, those kinds of things. And then, of course, um, you know, you're going to have some unexpected engine codes potentially throw after a relatively brief period of time. These are old cars. Even though you've scanned and looked, um, you know, some things can just come up. Uh, that maybe weren't an issue at the point in time that you bought the car, but they became an issue fairly soon thereafter. For every car that I buy in the four to $5,000 price range, I expect to spend about $1,000 on some combination of those sorts of things to be able to fix the cars up. And once I've done that, they tend to be pretty reliable and last for quite a while. You have obviously got maintenance that you have to continue to put into the cars, but um, there you go. That's the process that I use. If you have any enhancements or additional insights, I would love to. I would love to see your comments and interact with you. So please share um, what, how you would change the process, or maybe how you uh, do the process differently. Because I would very much like to, um, you know, maybe improve my process by seeing what you do. So if you like this video, please like it and subscribe to our channel. Um, you know, certainly would appreciate that. Um, until the next video, have a great day.